So I'm going to talk about the NSF Bro Center of Expertise um, a little bit today. Some of you may have heard of this uh, if you're at the Cybersecurity Summit, but a lot of you probably haven't. It just started in the past year <clears throat> since last October. Uh, so first, uh, I, I just want to remind people who are newer to Bro that it actually started off pretty academic. Uh, it started originally at LBL, but quickly spread beyond being used at just the DOE labs. And it was long used for, for research. So the first several BRO grants, uh, funded grants, at least from the National Science Foundation, were really funding R&D and networking research and security. <clears throat> and uh, some of the first users of BRO, you know, NCSA started using it in 2003. Uh, and then quickly it spread to some of the other centers uh, as well in the NSF supercomputing centers. It was also um, used at Ohio State shortly after then, and I think Penn State was another one, Seth, later on, some of the early ones. But it started off in a lot of these you know, EDU and uh, DOE labs. So NSF has always had this strong relationship supporting Bro, but around 2009, uh, they started supporting it operationally as well. And they sort of sh shifted in a huge way in that they viewed Bro as not just an interesting platform for research and answering your research questions, but also as something that their cyber infrastructure providers at the different centers and different universities started depending on. And so with that change, you know, they, they kicked off and they funded our, our first uh, big award, which is what brought you Bro 2.0 and really started spreading uh, the use of Bro a lot beyond uh, just universities and actually in industry and uh, federal government as well. <clears throat> so it was, shouldn't be any surprise, last October, uh, NSF, you know, as that award was uh, winding down, uh, they funded an official center here. And so I announced this at the Cybersecurity Summit last year. Uh, on October 1st, the first day of the government shutdown, of course, so uh, all the NSF people couldn't attend. <laughs> But now we've had almost a year with this new center, so I want to take a little bit of time and talk about uh, what we've done there and where we're going, particularly in respects to community engagement and the center activities and the outreach there. So what have we done? The first thing, and perhaps the most important thing is, we finally broke down and uh, we named it BroCon. So no more exchanges, no more events, no more workshops, no. Just kidding. Uh, second, we didn't realize this, we stole a name. So at first, apologies to the international people if they're from Ireland and they came here for a gaming convention. There's no gaming booths. There's no cosplay contest, I'm sorry. Yeah. There might be pub quizzes in BroCon After Dark. I'm not involved with that. <laughs> but uh, more seriously, uh, one of the first things we did was we had to hire people. It takes time to ramp up any sort of project in center. So uh, we have two new outreach coordinators. Uh, Jeanette, Dapide, if you want to, there's Jeanette, you met her. Uh, she works on the NCSA side and is um, involved with a lot planning BROCON, this event, handling a lot of the social media and doing some uh, new video work that she'll talk about in a little bit. There's also Doris, if you want to. Wave. Doris uh, started over at ICSI in Berkeley, and she is the keeper of the training materials, I'll say, and she's really focused on bringing Bro into the classroom, and uh, many of you probably saw her emails about the new Tuesday call and that. But now we're getting to the point where we're downright professional. We're not even handing out USB thumb drives behind, before the event and frantically copying them in the morning of. We got the VM out there a whole three or four days early. <laughs> Hopefully most of you downloaded it. <laughs> good, good. So one of the things, and I guess I do have to update, we're only at 145. I, I was expecting it to break 150, but if you count us, if you ask the caterers, we're 150 plus if you count the bro team. So <laughs> this is certainly the largest uh, bro event yet. And they keep growing, and we're having more and more events. Some of these are NSF. Most Many of these are NSF related, but not all of them. There's a DOE workshop they had this spring. Uh, the Cybersecurity Summit for the National Science Foundation, that's actually next week, so we'll have another event there. 
uh, shortly, and we're probably going to see more events uh, or bigger events. And I was going to mention where we are next year, but I can't quite release it. It's not quite confirmed, but we're going to probably have a new and exciting location next year. More exciting than Champagne. I know, it's hard to believe. So, uh, one of the things we've done is we've been collaborating a lot. So, part of, even with our proposal, we had collaborated with the Center for Trustworthy Scientific Cyber Infrastructure. I think that's what it is. I got to look at their logo. CTSC out of Indiana. So, CTSC is another NSF project that does a lot of outreach for security for National Science Foundation projects. They're located at Indiana University here at NCSA and at UW-Madison. And they're, they're the ones who are putting on the summit and started this NSF Cybersecurity Summit back up. And we've been in working with them and engaging different major projects like LIGO and, and other NSF projects on helping with their network security monitoring needs. They bring people to us who need help with those sorts of plans and <clears throat> it's been a good collaboration. We're also starting to collaborate more with ESNet, uh, especially on topics around software-defined networking integration. And I think, I hope this is an open list because I just realized I didn't ask Robin. It's open now. <laughs> it's open now. So if you're interested in bro and software-defined networking, <laughs> there's an email list to join. Uh, ESNet is really big into the science DMZ concept, which I won't go into too, really any detail here. Um, but, you know, we're working with them on that. We're going to be talking about the Science DMZ uh, work at the Internet2 Technology Exchange on a panel. Uh, we're on another panel with CTSC uh, talking about, you know, how to help secure uh, NSF projects. That's also at the Internet2 Tech Exchange, if any of you are going to that this October. Uh, we're working with, we're hoping to work with uh, a little more on this SDN work with uh, Indiana University and SciPass, and we might be involved with their demo at Supercomputing, so you might see us again there. And, uh, you know, ESNet's been very helpful in coordinating and bringing together people interested in those topics. But I'll let Robin talk more about our SDN roadmap a little later when he talks about the Bro roadmap, so. Okay, so who are we working with? Um, We've been engaging with, of course, a lot of the universities, big and small. The NSF center is mostly targeted at universities and NSF projects. So that you know, includes UW-Madison, Indiana, um, Rochester Institute of Technology, we've worked a little bit with. We've also been working with a lot of the big NSF centers and, and MFRCs, some of the big uh, observatories and um, large projects and centers, so like Ice Cube and LIGO, the Gravity Wave, and the Neutrino Detectors. Uh, surprisingly, we've actually worked with some K-12 schools. Um, so we, we've helped some uh, school district out in Utah uh, with some of their network security monitoring, so that was interesting. And now we've been working with, you know, where corporations are interested in the same thing, we're talking with a company out in Hungary who's also interested in education, outreach, and training, which I think their mission aligns with, with the centers as well. So what are we doing? Well, we're developing materials, and I'm going to, to let other people talk about what those new materials are in a little bit. We're, of course, helping people troubleshoot setups and stuff. Bro is still complicated, especially if you have a large cluster you have to set up. And so we've been helping a lot of people just do their planning, figure out, you know, what do you need for a Bro cluster? How should I monitor my network? How can I do it efficiently and cost-effectively? We're taking feedback all the time for future features. Uh, one of the things we've heard in, a lot in the past and we've worked on a lot recently, I think, is bro control. And in the next version, you'll see a lot of changes there. And uh, like I said, we're also helping with these new installations as well. So the more exciting part, and this is where I'm going to turn it over to other people to talk, is uh, the sort of secret and semi-secret and not-so-secret projects we've been working on. So some of these you may have heard of. Uh, Justin's going to talk first about try.bro.org, which is really cool. It's, it's a way that you could you know, run Bro anywhere without any sort of setup. For, it could be used for just helping somebody troubleshoot a Bro script over chat, just showing somebody what Bro is in a bar on your iPad if you want to. You know everybody's stuck in that situation sometimes. You could do the exercises yourself, and nothing needs to be installed or set up. John Ship's next going to talk about 
our future of what we hope will be the bro training VM, well not the VM, replacing the bro training VM in general, which is this new bro live setup. And it will be available to people who want to try it at this conference instead of the VM to do the exercises. But just keep in mind, it's beta. <laughs> We just got it moved over to the Amazon Web Services, though, so we, we should be good on capacity. Doris is going to talk a little bit more about the bro teaching community, and Jeanette's going to talk about uh, the more you bro, which is the sort of public thing that many of you might have seen. We've been tweeting these short five to six minute uh, sort of bro PSAs, I, I like I call them bite-sized bro. Uh, so anyways, I'm going to hand it over to Justin now. Uh, there he is. Thank you. You can use this one. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Do you, do you need the web browser? Yeah, and what did we do with the command line tool? Command line's right here. Where? <laughs> oh. Ropi. Okay. <laughs> I need my browser. Oh, you don't have it mirrored, do you? Mm -hmm. This is going to be a little. Ah. So, try.bro.org. Adam already explained what most of it is. It's basically just a web based bro. Um, the reason why I wrote it was I tried to help out on IRC, and there was one day, you know, someone's having trouble with, like, I think the exec framework. And I was like, well, can you paste bin your code? And he paste bins it. And I'm like, okay, you know, this line should be like this. And I verify that it works on my machine. I tell him, he comes back, you know, I'm still getting an error. And after going back, you know, three, four times, he finally got it to work. And I realized, you know, there was just a way, you know, because other projects have things like this where I could just have a script and you can run it and get the output, and he could see that it works, and I'm not just making this up. <laughs> you know, things would be a lot easier, and I could just link him to the results. Every uh, time you run something, you get a unique URL that you could just paste in the chat, and I've been using it here and there on IRC, and it's definitely made things a lot easier. So what kind of things can you do with Tribro? Um, you can run scripts, pretty obvious. Um, there's a couple of examples in here that show off you can do things like multiple files. So you can load up the Intel framework, which has two files here. And you can actually add files if you wanted to. So if you try to run this, you'd imagine input framework, it is going to do nothing because we have no PCAP. Well, Triborough lets you use PCAPs. You can pick, say, the, that one works with the HTTP PCAP. And if you run that, you will get your nice Intel log. And all the log files show up in a nice table. They're somewhat limited. That's one of the areas that it needs to be improved because some of these tables can be pretty gigantic. Um, and Adam, you don't have any PCAPs on your laptop, do you? No, to, I'm ashamed to, to say I don't. I forgot to ask him about that. Ah, so that's a slight problem. But one thing you actually do with Tribro is upload a PCAP. And it'll actually do it very efficiently. It'll hash it locally, check if the server has the hash, if not, uploads it and then remembers. So you can actually take a PCAP on your machine, upload it, and get the output from it. And one other neat thing you can do, if I could see here, not only can you run with the latest version of Bro, if I print Bro version and run that, You'll see it'll output 2.3, but we can pick bro 2.2 and verify that the script works with 2.2 as well, which makes it really easy to test and help people that are running older versions of bro. I could probably throw 2.1 on there if I wanted to, but no one's running 2.1, right? Nobody? You're all upgraded? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's the website. Uh, doesn't do much else. One other neat thing that I'm still kind of developing is, I think that was this file. So there's a command line version of bro. Oops. If I, you can do basically everything you can do through the website, and it uses the same API. So again, if I print bro version and save that, and you run it, you'll get the version. And one of the neat things is, since it's Bro as a service, you can tell it, hey, I want to do that with Bro 2.2, right. and it'll run it with 2.2. So you almost get all the benefits of running Bro locally, except you don't actually need to have Bro on your machine. Um, so that's basically what TryBro does now. There's a couple of things I've been 
meaning to implement as kind of next steps. Um, as you saw with the HTTP log, you'll get all the output files. It basically packages up anything that had log in its name. But what it won't do is file extractions, because um, those can be named really anything. So it's a little harder to figure out uh, what they were called and how to package them up and send them back to the browser. Plus, you also don't necessarily want to be sending back a five megabyte file back to the browser. This can get pretty big as it is. Um, one neat thing that we really want to do is make this embeddable. So any blog post about Bro or even potentially documentation can have live, runnable code snippets right in the documentation that you can mess with and tweak. It's really a big, I don't know if anyone programs in Go, but all their documentation does things like that, where there's just a little run button after the little code snippet. Um, so right now, every time you run something, you can you get this URL, and if you pasted that URL into someone else's browser, it'll go and run basically exactly what was on your screen. And that works, but as it is now, it's not very kind of social. Like there's no list of recently ran snippets. There's no user accounts. And I don't know if we necessarily want user accounts, but at least some listing if someone wants to make their script public, kind of more like a, a lot of the existing pastebin sites. Um, and one other neat thing is that I mentioned we're working on moving some stuff to Amazon. Running on Amazon lets us use a lot of their services. So things like S3 could be used to support things like larger PCAPs or keep results for, say, six months. Right now, it's limited to, say, five megabytes for a PCAP. But using S3 for object storage, we could let people upload, you know, five gigabyte PCAPs if they wanted to. I mean, it's much easier to scale when running on Amazon and using all their services. But that's just an idea right now. Um, but that's try, bro. Try to break it. I'd be impressed if you can break it. And I'll make it better so you can't. But it should be pretty hard to break as it is. Uh, it's, it's all built around Docker, so everything's containerized. Everything gets destroyed and recreated every time you run code. So it's pretty hard to do something you're not supposed to be able to do. But I'd be really interested in knowing if someone does manage to do something they're not supposed to do. Uh, OK, that's try, bro. <laughs> well, thank you. Just try to break it when it's on the Amazon web services. <laughs> and next week. <laughs> right now it's on eight-year-old hardware. OK, thank you, Justin. So let me bring up uh, John Shipp's slides. Uh, John Shipp uh, works here at NCSA in the security group. And he's going to talk about Bro Live, which we're testing out here. Thank you, John. OK, so uh, Bro Live is intended to provide uh, on-the-fly training environments. And the goal is to get rid of the burden of handing out, downloading, and passing around virtual machines. Because I think at the last, um, the Bro Exchange in 2013, there was uh, quite a bit of time taken to execute and get everybody up to, up to speed. And it was, it was over an hour. So if we can, get, we can diminish that time to allow more for training, it can improve conference experiences. And there's a few other problems. Uh, there's always technical difficulties at various conferences I've been at. There's always somebody that has a problem with VirtualBox. And most of the time, it's a bus configuration or the network configuration. So typically, people have to go around when someone puts their hands up in the air and says, hey, I need help, and they'll just take the time out to actually solve their problem. And it always puts those people behind. And for the administrator, or the person who has to set up those VMs, they have to do it constantly. If it, it, what, do, what, do, what happens in the case where a exercise changes or someone inserts the wrong one inside the directory that's in the virtual machine. Do they have a way to go out and download uh, new exercises or updated ones? And that's, that's just one of the problems with handling, handing out virtual machines. So we're kind of make this more automated and streamlined. And the solutions are get rid of VMs if you can. Those are, there's definitely cases in conferences where you need virtual man's machines to do the stuff you need to do. But that may not be all the time. So like in the case of Brocom, we're pretty much you just need a, a shell and to run uh, commands, you'll be, be all right. So what we can do is make the barriers as thin as possible, 
by using SSH. It's because um, SSH is ubiquitous. Everybody has it available for many different architectures and platforms. And you can actually use it on phones and tablets. So maybe you don't need to bring your laptop. You can just bring those devices. Um, and for the admins, what we do, instead of putting the burden on the users, like in the former case, where the users are required to download a VM or get it at the conference, uh, we can pass it on to the admins. So set everything up beforehand for the users, allow the users to log in, and then everything is there taken care of. So for the Bro Live implementation, this is, these are the components, these are the major components. And everybody's familiar with all these except maybe one, and that is Docker. I'm sure there's plenty of people in here that have heard of Docker. Anybody? Docker experience? Heard of Docker? All right, cool. So um, Docker provides a layer of abstraction. It basically talks to um, C groups and namespaces in the Linux kernel and allows you to create containers. And uh, Docker used to directly call the Linux containers the LXC commands before, but now they use libcontainer to make all their calls, and that's what creates the containers on the fly. And I should note it's important to say Linux-based containers. I'm guilty also of not using that, just saying Linux containers. And that is because there are different types of container implementations. And the reason there is is because there's no specification on what a container is or should do. And there's a few examples. And a bit, but a, basically, a container provides lightweight, uh, lightweight process virtualization. And where VMs do virtu or hardware virtualization. That's the big difference. And uh, containers are now more common because in the 3.8 kernel, we, we introduced namespaces and control groups. And these are the two building blocks of creating uh, containers. And uh, some advantages, they're very fast, lightweight. It takes seconds to start up or tear down a container. In virtual machines, it can take minutes, depending on how much stuff there is. Um, next thing, you can run, I don't have any use cases for this, but it's possible to run containers in containers. Um, everything's isolated, and um, you can run hundreds or thousands of containers on a single machine, which is really awesome. How many did we have in that one old Linux run? Oh, I did a test of 200 containers on this old server, and all running Bro in a for loop, uh, reading 10 different PCAPs, and it was able to work just still. I could still shell in and type commands, so I was pretty excited. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Basically, this is what it looks like. Uh, so a user is given a, an account to our Bro Live server. And they're just going to type SSH, you know, the account name in the server. They're going to log in. And then it's going to create this shell script I wrote comes up with a menu and says, hey, what would you, what would you like to do? It would be a new user or an existing user? So you create the account on the fly right there. And then what happens in the background after the account is created, Docker is called. And Docker puts that person inside a shell. And that is the reason how, that's, how that works is basically setting the shell as my shell script. So in their Etsy shells, the, my shell script's in there, and then when the password file says, hey, launch the shell, and that user logs in. So what then happens is um, they actually are in a container, their own virtual environment, and they wouldn't know the difference. They can, they're out of shell, they can type commands, they can traverse the, the file system and everything. So all the standard Unix tools are there, and, uh, and Bro is there. And then the user would log out when, it's time, when they're done with their day, and they can come back in and connect to the container again. And if they create any new files, they will be there for the next session. And security considerations. So we don't want anybody breaking our awesome system here. So um, networking is completely disabled. You cannot ping, can't do anything, can't talk to the loopback address even, I think. So uh, that's, that's kind of nice. Um, and you can do allocation per container. So you can say, I want to assign a container to this CPU or allocate this much RAM to this container. So we limit it for each one to prevent abuse and selfishness. So um, also, containers are removed after a period of time. Typically, it's set in a script that says, hey, this is the length. This is in days of a conference. And after that, the user accounts of the containers are removed. And one tricky thing was getting uh, limiting, because there's no, there's no um, namespace for disks. How can you limit the size of someone's container? And there's actually, uh, I found out with a lot of research, it just came out in the latest Docker versions, brand new, but uh, you can use device mapper in the directory that, or the device that we use, it would be actually limited and bind to that. So we can limit the disk space so no one can just uh, you know, run yes and then a string of characters into a file and the system is blown up, so. And then we do finer limits with ulimit. And the cool thing about this is that you guys can all run your own. 
This is publicly available, and you can download it from, you can actually fire up, if you want to use my Vagrant file, you can Vagrant up and have this. So if you have your own events you want to host for bro training, you can actually replicate this. And I'm actually going to, whatever we're using, I'm probably going to keep it very close to what, we're have, what we have in production. So I'll update my stuff, my files in my, in that, uh, my GitHub repo. So you can play with it, and you can use it to teach. And let's demo it real quick. Cancel. <laughs> okay, and that password I typed in, I'll be sharing that with everybody. We'll post that. Okay, so it asks us what we want to do. We are a new user. All right, and we're going to choose a username, and I'm going to say John Sh or J Ship. Choose a password. Verify the password. There we go, accounts created, I'm actually in a container now. So from here, we have all the exercises for the conference in the exercises directory. So we can go in here, and there they are. So what you would do, if you want to follow along, just run bro, exercises, bro con. And the directory is read-only, so you can actually can't go in there and do it, so I'm doing it from my home directory. And then we do, let's say, beginner. Let's run the beginner pcap here. Sure. Like that? Yep. Okay. And then we'll run the HTTP PCAP file. And there's our log. So there you go. If you don't want to use VM or VMs, you can try this out. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. And the last thing really is this is the beta is live today, so Please let me know if you experience any problems, have any feature requests or suggestions. You can tweet at me, find me. I'm walking around, usually or sitting down, more likely sitting down. And then you can all, yeah, so you can email me either of those addresses. Thank you. Thanks, John. I got it. Is anyone on there right now using it? Awesome. Right. Let me uh, bring up Doris's slides really quickly to talk, to talk about the teaching community. Did you put it on there? It's a recovery drive. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Actually, okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Doris Schuberg. I'm kind of new to the whole bro team. My job description is bro outreach uh, coordinator, but my love actually is teaching. So I try to improve the training material and find new ways to teach bro and with bro. The whole bro teaching community project is a collaboration with Bill Stackpole at the moment. We are open for more collaborators. So if you want to join and want to really be involved, just let me know. So what's that all about? Um, it's about teaching Bro itself. That's what we are here for. But also using Bro while teaching. Um, teaching a networking class or a security class or whatever you can think of where Bro might be useful. Probably it's computer science though. Um, we are thinking about university classes, college classes. We want to get rid of the books and put more, more practice, practice there. We are also thinking about your own security IT team at your company. 
make their job less striking down. Or any other team in, in the IT industry. So what do we do? We want to exchange knowledge. We want actually you to exchange knowledge. We will only provide you the platforms and the infrastructure to do that. We will be there. And uh, we also want you to exp exchange your experiences with teaching role. What were the pitfalls? Uh, what did you learn for yourself? What do you use? Um, methods. How do you teach it? Is it better to let people try it out? Is it better to do a front class for your own team or for your own class? And um, as well, materials like slides, exercises, maybe even PCAPs if that is possible. That's sometimes uh, a privacy issue, but there are ways to do that. <coughs> How? Yeah, you can connect with the Broad teaching community through the teaching mailing list. That's teaching at Broad.org. To subscribe, you have, though, to um, write to info at Broad.org. Um, we have a weekly online meeting. Online meeting meaning we um, usually use GoToMeeting, so we do a video chat, or you can also call in via the phone only. And we provide a Git repository, which is restricted in access. This is not public. This is important for um, college and university teachers. They usually need a source or a place for their exercises and exams that are not directly public. I mean, students always get access to things if they really want to. But um, it helps a lot if it's um, at least restricted to plan for exams, for example. So if you want to be part of the Git repository, we expect a small, a short um, introduction of yourself so we know there's not a student subscribing for his whole class to get the exercises. Um, you can email to info at bro.org if you want to join us, or you just talk to me here these days. I will be around all the time. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doris. I'm really excited about this initiative, too, because I think it's important for us to grow as a self-sustaining community, to not just do the teaching ourselves, but to help people bring bro to others. So. It's all part of our evil plans for a domination, so thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, last person here um, to present is Jeanette uh, Dapheide, and she has been producing the More You Bro videos, if any of you have seen those, and we'll be talking about them here. So let me bring this up, and I think the audio should work. Okay. Welcome, Jeanette. Thank you. Hello again. I'm Jeanette Dopheide. I'm Education Outreach Coordinator for the Bro Project. And I'm going to talk today about the more you bro. Um, as Adam has spent this time explaining, uh, we have a deep in in interest in education outreach. It's part of how we're going to build our community and keep people using bro. and. So I was uh, given a task, produce videos for a new series called The More You Bro. Uh, I had a, a couple of requirements for the video series. It had to be five to 10 minutes in length. Um, closer to five is the, is the aim, and that's what I've been focusing on. We want to focus on a single task or to topic. We don't want to overload people with too much information. And uh, in keeping with the time limit, that works well. We want it to be approachable to new users. Uh, that's a, of a particular interest to me because I'm kind of new to this, uh, this technology industry that, that we're all working in. Uh, we, we want to include screenshots of Bro uh, because a lot of our videos that we have are typically of conference talks and we wanted these videos to look a little bit more polished uh, and again, going back to the approachable to new viewers, having screenshots will help accomplish that goal. And then finally, uh, Adam wanted these to be almost scripted in a sense that it, sh it demonstrates that we have thought out what we're going to show people and uh, using good audiovisual quality. So for our first video, 
we reached out for help drafting a short list of topics for videos. Uh, and then John Shipp, who came up earlier and showed you guys Bro Live, he expressed some interest in working on the project with us. And we had a brainstorming meeting to identify the task lists for the first video. Uh, John and I met and we kind of talked about some of our ideas and we settled on log parsing tips and tricks as the first video. And I want to talk a little bit about the process of producing the videos. We pick a topic, which we did. Uh, I was really fortunate in that John already has a couple blog posts that I could use to help me base my script on. So I used blog posts and bro documentation to draft a script. Then I send the script to uh, a team for tech, the, the bro team for technical feedback and they give me some suggestions. Um, we shoot the video and um, I just want to tell you guys if you have ever produced a video, <laughs> a five minute video is could t surprisingly take up a, a large chunk of time. So if you want to uh, shoot a video, make sure you have enough time. I, usually we plan about four hours because we want to shoot, uh, this is another part, we want to shoot the video first and then apply the audio second and so uh, that takes a little bit of time to do that. Then I edit the video and send it off to the team to review and request feedback and then I post it up on YouTube, uh, Twitter and Google Plus. So uh, I've really been uh, happy with the amount of feedback that we've been getting in the sense of the number of people that have subscribed to our YouTube channel. Are any of you guys subscribers to the YouTube channel? Yep. So have you guys seen the videos? Some of them? Yep. Great. Uh, lessons learned. I learned a lot about uh, uh, producing videos. Uh, keep the script light. Make sure that the language is don't overwhelm people with too many words too quickly. Uh, focus on a few main points and keep a relaxed tone. I learned a lot about video editing. <laughs> uh, record the screencast first and then the audio second. That helped uh, shave off a lot of time actually. The, our first video, uh, poor John, I think worked with, with me for about eight hours to produce because <laughs> we were trying to film uh, video and audio at the same time and, and then that didn't work so well. I learned a lot about different types of software. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of Camtasia or Snagit. They, they are made by the same company. Uh, iMovie, QuickTime. Uh, and then uh, recording room and equipment, uh, selecting a good room. You want a room with uh, lots of soft materials around, nothing too echoey because it'll, it'll affect the sound of the, the quality of the video. And uh, I prepare title and transition slides to fill in the gaps. Uh, the future of the more you grow. This, the series is our most popular or it's been our most popular video series so far. The goal is to hit 1,000 views, so uh, at least for one video. So if you guys are seeing a video and you're really pumped about it, please tweet it and send it to people. That would be really gratifying. Future topics, uh, what is Bro, how to install Bro, uh, how to load scripts, and suggestions are welcome. If you guys have some topics, uh, a, a piece of bro that was very frustrating to you when you were learning it and now that you've learned it you want to share uh, how to how to do this thing with other people let us know let me know and I'll be happy to take down your ideas and and start coming up with a script so uh, let's let's look at one of these videos because we've got some time I'm Sorry. going to show you guys the one I like the most it's the setting up a cluster <laughs> for those from your childhood Hi. memories. My name is John Schiff, and I'm a security engineer for the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Today I'm going to show you how to set up a standard bro cluster. Since the configuration is standard, I'm not going to discuss load balancing traffic, security conscious permissions, or other tuning options. Our goal is to get you set up as quickly as possible so you can begin to familiarize yourself with tasks and management of a bro cluster. I'll be using three virtual machines, each running Ubuntu on the same network segment. For the purpose of this demonstration, we are using a tool called Vagrant, which allows us to manage the VMs more easily. Before we continue, let's run through the requirements. One machine will act as the manager and proxy. The proxy keeps state and shares information between the bro workers, which is why it is commonly installed on the manager. The remaining two machines will be our worker nodes, one worker for each machine. 
These machines will be collecting and analyzing the network traffic. Let's get started. Now that we have our three VMs ready to go, let's install Bro on the manager. First, let's become the root user. Second, we'll install the dependencies. And lastly, we'll install the latest version of Bro. The Bro Manager manages the workers by performing tasks like starting, stopping, and monitoring the workers, pushing out new configurations, and printing statistics. The Manager performs these tasks by connecting to the workers using a passwordless SSH public key. Let's generate that SSH key now. Next, we'll create our .SSH directories and copy the public key to the worker machines. To check that it worked correctly, we'll connect to one of the worker nodes. It did not request a password, which means the key was copied correctly. The next step in setting up our cluster is to edit the manager's configuration files so that it knows which machines are its workers. The default install prefix for Bro is user local Bro, and the configuration file is located in the Etsy directory. Now let's modify the default cluster configuration file node.cfg from its standalone configuration to a new cluster configuration. Back on the manager side, I'm going to launch the Bro Control tool in interactive shell mode. Then I'll issue the install command, which will install Bro as well as copy our configuration files to the Bro workers. The install command completed successfully. We'll move on to checking our work. Let's make sure the configuration doesn't contain any errors using the check command. Everything is okay, which means we can start the cluster. If you don't want to use Bro Control's interactive mode, you can enter the command directly in the terminal. Let's check the status of all the Bro processes. Everything looks good here. If you see crash under the status column, you can run the bro control dyad command, which will help you troubleshoot why the crash is occurring. Let's generate a log file as a follow-up sanity check. Thanks for watching our presentation on setting up a standard bro cluster. To learn more about using Bro, you can check out the website at bro.org, follow them on Twitter, at bro underscore IDS, or check out more talks and presentations on their YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash bro platform. So don't forget to see me about any topics if you find this uh, interesting. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeanette, and voice of John. Uh, so that's what we've done so far this, well, it hasn't even been a year yet since we started the Bro Center. <clears throat> and there's more things coming, like I said. Uh, I think a lot of the things that are coming in the next year and we hope to make progress on is more focus on software-defined networking and the Science DMZ concept of an open, secure, monitored network uh, based on the ESNet model. We're going to see more workshops and meetings for sure. Uh, like I said, I hope we have a, there's a good chance we'll have an, a different location, an East Coast location next year we're hoping for. So, And maybe we'll be 200 by then. Uh, more videos. Please send ideas to Jeanette if you have any. And if you get them to 1,000 this week, you'll see a very happy genetic Brocon, so just saying. <laughs> um, other things we're looking at, we, we'd like to make try.bro.org something embeddable, something that you could just place inside of your website. You'll see it on the bro.org website in the future, but I'd like it to be something you could put in any of your websites for your class or something like that. More Bro in the Classroom, that initiative's really just ramping up, but so it's hard to say where that will go exactly, but we're hoping to bring Bro to the classroom and create some good materials this year. Um, and finally, I'll say a new website. And I say question mark because this is something I just want to throw out there and remind people. We're always looking for someone who's technically skilled and creative. Uh, we're technically skilled, but we're not the most creative necessarily with web design. So if there's anybody interested in some co contract work out there for a redesign of a website, please contact Robin or I. So. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, I think we'll start the break a little early, Jeanette.